Well, <laughs> I run through the really big names in Jewish thinking and Jewish mystical thinking, especially. It would be remiss without the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Rizato, Derech Hashem, the way of God. I love this stuff. I'm going to jump to human responsibility. Because I'm going to do both Hebrew and English. I think I'll do the two English and then the Hebrew. In this world, man's condition depends on two things. There is on the one hand his own makeup, the elements of his being, and their structure. Secondly, there is his environment and all that is associated with it. As discussed earlier, man consists of two opposites, a body and a soul. It is obvious, however, that the physical is dominant in man and its influence is very strong. When an individual is born, he is almost completely physical, with the mind having only a very small influence. As he matures, his mind continues to gain influence depending on the individual's nature. Even after an individual matures, however, the physical does not automatically relinquish in its influence and stop inclining the indiv individual towards its way. The only means by which one can overcome the physical is by growing in wisdom, becoming versed in it and living by it, by fortifying oneself to follow his intellect one can overcome his physical nature and keep the physical desires in him firmly bridled. We see material phenomena before our eyes, but in essence, at a deeper level, all that is material is inherently dark and coarse, existing at the opposite pole from those seeking to approach God and cling to His holiness. Even though the soul is intrinsically pure and lofty, as soon as it associates itself with the physical body and becomes entangled with the material world, it becomes divorced from its true nature and its influence towards something that is its precise opposite. As long as the soul remains in the body, it is imprisoned by a restraining power, and unless it can overcome this power, it cannot act freely. God decreed that this combination of body and soul must ultimately be a permanent one. Even though the two separate at death, this is only a temporary state, existing only until the resurrection. After the resurrection, body and soul must coexist forever. The soul must therefore be able to work, strengthen itself, gradually weaken the occluding power of the physical, and thus bring enlightenment to the body. The body then becomes able to elevate itself together with the soul so that they can both experience the highest light. This is the exact opposite of man's present condition, where the soul is dimmed and depressed because of the body. As long as man is in this world, because he is in a state where his physical nature is very strong, since the physical is opaque and unenlightened, man exists in a state of great darkness. Far from his rightful state of closeness to God, man must therefore make every effort to make his soul overcome the physical, and thereby improve his condition and elevate himself to his rightful state. Man's environment and everything in it are also physical and filled with darkness. Since they relate to his environment, his activities also cannot be other than physical. Because of its physical nature, man's very constitution forces him to engage in worldly pursuits. It is impossible for him to live without eating, drinking, and other essential bodily functions, and he must also earn a livelihood to obtain these necessities. Because of his body, environment, and activities, man is therefore constantly involved with the physical and immersed in its darkness. Accordingly, both great effort and a powerful struggle are required if he is to elevate himself to a more enlightened state. God's design, however, is very deep, and he arranged things so that even though a man must be immersed in the physical, he is able to rise to perfection through his worldly activities in the physical world itself. 
it is precisely through these that he attains a pure and lofty state. It is therefore his very lowliness that elevates him, for when he trans dark transforms darkness into light and deathly shadow into sparkling brilliance, he personally earns for himself unparalleled excellence and glory. This is a result of the fact that God arranged and circumscribed the ways in which man should make use of the world and its creatures according to their intended purpose. When man abides by the limits, arrangements, and intentions ordained by the Creator, then the mundane activities themselves become acts of perfection. Through them, man can incorporate in himself perfection and excellence, and thus raise himself high above his previous lowly state. The highest wisdom took into account all the categories of man's natural faults as well as all the concepts of true excellence and value required by man to come close to God and enjoy his good. Taking everything into account, he set up patterns and restraints through which everything excellent should be incorporated in man and everything separating him from God removed. Just one second, I need a tissue. <sighs> Sorry. Okay, if it were not for the desire that man must die. If it, no, sorry, <laughs> not the desire. If it were not for the decree that man must die, these deeds would allow the soul to strengthen itself and dispel the body's darkness to such an extent that the soul would be able to completely enlighten and purify the body until the soul and body together would be elevated to nearness to God. Because of the decree, however, this cannot be done in a single stage. The soul still strengthens itself through these observances, and the body is potentially enlightened, even though its enlightenment cannot be immediately realized. What man, therefore, earns during his current non-ideal state of being after Adam's sin is a potential state of perfection at the proper time this potential is realized. These patterns and restraints are God's commandments. They include both positive commands and prohibitions. The purpose of each commandment is either to allow man to earn and incorporate himself a particular level of true excellence or to remove an area of deficiency in darkness. This is accomplished through doing what the commandments require and avoiding what they forbid. The nature and details of each individual commandment, however, are based on all the aspects of man's true nature and character as well as that of the necessary perfection. Each thing, then, has its conditions and limits as required for man's attaining this perfection. The highest wisdom knows all this as well as the true nature and purpose of everything that exists. God, therefore, took everything into account and included everything necessary in the commandments of the Torah. It is thus written in Devarim 6.24, God commanded us to follow all these rules that he may grant us good. Man serves God by observing all his commandments, and the root purpose of this service is to make man always conscious of God and to turn him in God's direction. The guiding principle is that man must realize that God created him only so that he could have the opportunity to draw himself close to his creator. But this closeness becomes possible only if man overcomes his evil urge, consciously deciding to subjugate himself to his creator and fulfill God's commands. Man must reverse his inclination towards the physical, conquering his mundane tendencies, but he will be able to do so only if he manages all of his affairs only for the sake of attaining this goal having no desire for anything else. Everything that man should do can be divided into two categories. First, there is what he does as a result of a commandment. The second is what is done out of necessity. The first category includes all the divine commandments. The second includes everything that man does while making use of the world to satisfy his needs. 
The purpose of the divine commandments has already been discussed, namely that man should obey God's orders and fulfill his will. In doing so, he conforms to God's will in two interrelated ways. First of all, he obeys God's will as doing what he was commanded to do. Secondly, however, he also perfects himself to that certain degree associated with that particular commandment. You do it for your own good. In doing so, he is conforming to God's will all the more since God desires that man be perfected and attain the enjoyment of his good. Man's use of this world for his own needs, however, should also be circumcised by the limits imposed by God's will and not include anything forbidden by God. It should be motivated by the need to best maintain his health and preserve his life and not merely to satisfy his physical urges and superfluous desires. One's motivation in maintaining his body should furthermore be so that the soul should be able to use it to serve its creator without being hampered by the body's weaknesses and incapability. When man makes use of the world in this manner, this in itself becomes an act of perfection, and through it, one can attain the same virtue as in keeping the other commandments. Indeed, one of the commandments requires that we keep our bodies fit so that we can serve God, and that we derive our needs from our environment to achieve this goal. In this manner, we elevate ourselves, even through such activities. The world itself is also elevated, since it is then also helping man to serve God. The love and fear of God are powerful means which draw an individual close to God. They enlighten the physical darkness in man, cause his soul to radiate in all its brightness, and thus elevate him step by step until he attains a state of closeness to God. Now this chapter goes on, but I, uh, I'm a little out of breath. So I'm going to take a break.